Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Anthony Mormile. I am the new guidance supervisor for, for the school district. Uh, when I was hired, I started in September. Um, one of the first things I did was try to put this night together. And I, I can't believe a month later, uh, here we are. Um, tonight, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jamie O'Hara. He is the Vice President of Enrollment Management or nearby at Ryder University. Now, he's not the person that we've uh, advertised uh, that was going to come here. Um, that person had a, had a last minute uh, change in plans and couldn't make it. Um, so we're lucky to have uh, Jamie up. He's actually higher uh, than, than the person that, that we had originally. So, you know, for what, for what that's worth. Okay, so thank you for coming out. And thank you, Jamie, for coming out. Mr. Jamie O'Hara. I'm glad you're pausing before, in case you don't want to pause after. Uh, the one thing I will try and do is gear it towards who's in front of me. So can I just see a show of hands? How many seniors in the audience? OK. Juniors? And sophomores or freshmen? OK. All right, so what I'm, what I'm attempting to do, and somebody will give me a, a heads up or a time piece. Is this best if I use the microphone? Yeah. Okay, so that's gonna time me here. I'd rather walk around, but I'll use the microphone. I'll give a timing piece because we do wanna, I'd actually like to try and do it in less than 45 minutes uh, because I think one of the more valuable pieces, and I'm starting my start watch, uh, one of the more valuable pieces for all of you folks is going to be the Q&A. So let me just run through this. And if I'm going too fast or if you don't under, understand anything or you want me to repeat it, uh, no problem. Just raise a hand and I'll just ask, um, Tony, if you could keep an eye on hands. Uh, we will have the Q&A afterwards, but if there's something you have to ask me as we're going through the slides, please don't hesitate because it, it's fine to interrupt me. Um, as Tony said, I'm James O'Hara, uh, go by Jamie, and uh, as Vice President of Enrollment Management, I oversee the admission area, the admission, uh, both the undergraduate and graduate areas, as well as the financial aid and bursar area. So I do uh, have the ability to get a little more in depth with financial aid and also payment type of pieces. Uh, it will be very early for juniors to do that. But for some of the seniors in the audience, if you're looking about the ability to pay or how to figure out those things, that's, that's absolutely something we can cover as we go through. I'm just gonna jump in with the agenda. We'll spend some time on the decision-making process, college visits, application process, application review, and what happens after you're accepted. So decision-making process. Uh, as far as how you go through the decision-making process, I would ask you to think about this visual of three different areas that are gonna be important to you. One's gonna be the academic, one's gonna be the environment, and I think for most everyone these days, financial is gonna be one of those pieces. <clears throat> if you think about academic, I think one of the things that you wanna focus in, in, in is what type of school you're gonna feel most comfortable with. There might, see, might be some parents out there that won't be satisfied unless they see their son or daughter enrolled at Harvard, Yale, or Princeton down the road. One of the things that I think is critical is you need to remember that there's 3,200 colleges and universities. And one of the most critical pieces to remember is for your son or daughter, or for you if you're in the audience, where is it that you're gonna feel most comfortable? Where are you going to say, from an academic perspective, I wanna be in a room this large for all of my classes, filled with you know, three or 400 uh, folks when I'm taking a class? Or do I want 50? Or do I want 20? And do I want to pick a university or an institution based upon one academic area that I know I'm going to study? Or do I want to pick an institution, a university, or college based upon knowing that they have four to five of the majors that I'm most interested in? The second is environment. And environment is what a lot of people talk about 
as the personal fit. And who has visited campuses so far? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. There, there's probably one of three things that can ha happen when you go to visit that campus. The first is you start to drive in and you tell mom and dad, this is not for me and we're not even staying for the tour and you leave. The second is that immediately you feel that this could be the fit and you wanna explore more. The third is you're lukewarm and you like things that you see, but you're not sure that it's the right place. So you start to dig a little deeper. I will tell you that if you're in that car, and, um, and some parents might not like this advice, but if you're in that car and your son or daughter is telling you this is just not it, it, it you know them best, but quite frankly, that might not be it for them. Uh, you might find other things to do that day as, as instead of visiting the campus. Because that personal fit is really, uh, from a study perspective and from what we've seen with, with uh, students, what they experience on campus, what you feel when you see the students that are walking around or what happens in the cafeteria or, or uh, what, types of, what type of um, diversity you're seeing on campus, what type of... Um, uh, types of students that you're seeing is a really cri critical piece. You need to be happy there. Uh, so if you're, if you're definitely going to be a residential student, that personal fit is gonna play an even larger part. The third piece is the financial fit. And I'm gonna urge you to do one thing. Don't do a drive-by when it comes to the financial fit. Because obviously I'm representing a private university. And one of the things that I hear often is I'm not at having my son or daughter look at Ryder because of the cost. I think one of the things that you'll hear again and again from my colleagues in the private university uh, setting is that there are a number of opportunities that we offer in the form of scholarships and financial aid. So that financial fit is something that you need to dig a little deeper. And you need to do it at the beginning stages but then you'll get more involved in the process in your senior year when you start to complete the FAFSA. And I'll talk about that a little later. So those three pieces are really what it's about. And I, I wanna say you want that happy mix of making sure that the academic, the environment, and the financial really go together well. We call it the three, uh, the three legs of the stool because we find when the student doesn't uh, retain to a university after the first year, it's usually because one of those legs of the stool was not the fit. It was too short or, or too long. Um, so what do you know and what don't you know? I'm just gonna go through all these together. Do you know your career goals? Are they things that you're sitting here saying, I know I wanna be a doctor? and um, I've taken all the APs that are offered here at Lawrenceville and I am going to be a doctor. Or are you sitting here saying, I really don't know what my career goals are, but I'm looking at these three different areas. Are you looking at the pieces of lifestyle and learning? And when I say lifestyle and learning, it then goes back to the campus piece. Is it gonna be residential? Is it not gonna be residential for you? Is it going to be a situation where you want an institution that's well known for its social life and its clubs and activities, or are you looking for a, a more elite uh, learning environment that also has those social clubs and activities but has a different type of balance? What's the location? Uh, the most interesting part for me, um, having lived now in New Jersey for nine years and before that in New York and in Pennsylvania, is the amount of students that leave the state of New Jersey to study in other states. And when I talk to students about why they leave, they, they say, I just wanna get out of New Jersey. And I'm never sure what exactly that means, but I think what it means more so than anything is they wanna break out. They want their own independence. But New Jersey, as you may know, has the largest migration of students leaving the state for college. 40% uh, of our students that study in New Jersey leave the state. And I'm, um, as you could imagine, going to give a plug for considering the great universities in New Jersey. Because uh, I know this might be very, way too close for you, uh, because Ryder is something you probably pass every day. But we have such a great amount of opportunities, both north and south in the state. 
great state institutions as well as private universities that I would urge you to consider. Again, budget. Budget's going to be key. Now, I ran down this list, and I want you to think about what you don't know. Because, and I want to say very clearly, what you don't know, it is okay. Because this process, particularly for the juniors, you're just starting it. And you will start to hear a lot of different things and start to see a lot of different campuses, which will, I think more than anything, define for you what you don't want. And by defining what you don't want, you start to lead down a path about what it is that you really do want. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there. For seniors, um, you may feel, because it's the middle of October, that you should know even more right now. But I will tell you, uh, we had an open house a few weeks ago where we had uh, just about um, 600 students in, uh, with their families on campus. And many of those folks were still just exploring for the first time, visiting colleges and universities for the first time. So if you were out there in your junior year and you were out there in, uh, during the summer, senior year, terrific, that's great. But for those of you that are just now getting serious about your search, I don't want you to feel like, I don't want you to feel anxiety about being far behind because this process will start to accelerate, but you just need to make the time and make the process work for you. All right, so this is more specific to juniors, so let me just run through it. How are you gonna build your list? What I would recommend first and foremost is the College Board website. I think it's a terrific website. It's collegeboard.org. Um, it's, uh, I know you um, probably have Naviance and are using Naviance. Uh, College Board just gives you that opportunity to plug in a lot of different types of things and develop your list. Uh, school guides, you know, there was a day 20 to 30 years ago you had all, all these big books and you were pouring over them. Most of it is web-based now. Don't underestimate and always look towards your guidance counselor because the counselors within the schools will also help you develop that all important list of what is an appropriate school for you as well as what might be that reach institution and what might be that safety institution. You have terrific teachers here at, at uh, Lawrenceville. So definitely take advantage of talking to them as well. Once you start developing that stronger list of profiles, whether it's through these, uh, these areas that I've mentioned or others, you need to start to, vil uh, to visit the college websites. And many people have said to me, I can get a feel, many uh, students have said to me, I can feel what the college is like by the website. And I would agree with you to a certain extent, but you also need to get there and touch and feel the community. Because the, the website will show you, the website is usually uh, something that lives with the enrollment person. It's in the marketing area of the institution. So it will show you a lot of happy, shiny people on, uh, on the site. And what you need to do is really get there and get a better sense of the institution. I've heard people say, oh, I, I totally put that off my list because I didn't like their website. I, I wouldn't do that. That's not exactly a drive-by for me. I think you need to actually get to the campus and feel a little more. Friends and family are a big one. Uh, many of the parents in this room, I'm sure, have uh, experience with colleges and universities, have friends that have experience with colleges and universities. Don't underestimate those types of anecdotal pieces about what has been experienced. What I always think is important when you're talking to friends and family is what's important to you. Uh, what, what I'm hearing a lot from parents and students currently is uh, about outcomes. Will my son or daughter get a job when they graduate? So one of the questions that I always recommend, because I have friends that have uh, kids going through this process now, I, I say, you know, they ask me, what's the most important question I should be asking? And I, I say, how good is their career service office? What are the internships and co-ops those students are getting? And um, if their son or daughter already graduated from that college, how has that experience been? Are, are they gainfully employed? Are they experiencing the, um, the attention that they need to get into the right graduate programs? That's all really important types of things 
that you can get a much better interaction with your family and friends when you ask those types of questions. Magazine rankings. Everybody thinks things are focused on U.S. News and World Report, and I think uh, whether it's Princeton Review, U.S. News and World Report, it's, it, for me, it's a great starting place. It's very similar to the College Board website. It lets you to look at data, and if there's parents in the um, audience that want to manage this search process through an Excel spreadsheet, I think, it's, I, I think this is where you go, because you get a lot of the data that's going to be important to do some comparison shopping. That being said, these rankings and um, the pieces of, uh, of uh, just, just anything like a Forbes, a Princeton Review, or US News, they tend to become less important when you start to go back and look at the academics, the affordability, and the fit, the personal attention. The last one is not real, map and a dartboard. And I hope you're not, uh, I hope you're not approaching it that way. But what I will tell you, because it's still true and it's still what I give advice when I talk to uh, family and friends uh, about the search process, is uh, try to enjoy the process as you're going through it. Uh, if, you, if you try to cram in more than two college visits a day, you're going to drive yourself crazy and you're going to be cranky in the car. Try and figure out if you know that you want to go to Boston or Philadelphia, that you're also seeing part of those cities and make it a family trip or do something that is going to give you that experience uh, as opposed to just visiting those schools. You might be building family memories, uh, and they, now that uh, the student is moving out of your home, quite possibly, these are great opportunities to really start to look at uh, spending some quality time. Um, so speaking about the college visit, how do you do one? Pretty basic. Check the college website. I guarantee it will be very direct in telling you how to visit. And if it isn't, then uh, there's always the phone. But you can look and see what is important to you. I, I'm going to break down some of these open house tours, interviews, and student for a day, because you might not know how they all fit together. The other one that I would include is information sessions, because a lot of people, a lot of universities will do information sessions together with tours or with interviews. What is the best time to go to visit a college? Open house is a great time if you want to get the full experience of an institution, meaning that you not only want to talk to the admission folks, but you want to talk to the faculty in um, either a, a, a across the table type of setting or small group type of presentations. That's when you should go to an open house. If you just want to do a tour of a campus, I would say just a tour of a campus is usually when that school is a maybe on your list. A tour and an information session, which most colleges and universities offer during the week as well as on the weekends, that gives you a little more to go on. But you're probably not going to be able, particularly if you do it on the weekend, to meet with faculty or meet with coaches if, if those two, two things are important to you. So if you do have the ability to take some time and do a, a, um, a tour and an um, information session, I would schedule it during the week if it's important for you to meet with faculty and, uh, and with coaches. Interviews, there's, uh, such a, there's two types of interviews. One is an informative interview. That's what we do at Ryder. Uh, we share information, and it's not required. And then the other is a competitive interview. The competitive interview is part of your admission process. And you will know as you start to look into colleges and universities which institutions require a competitive interview. If they suggest a competitive interview, I suggest you do it. Because I've worked at institutions in which um, it's been suggested, but it wasn't required. And it will certainly give you an opportunity, particularly if that's a first choice type of institution, for you to get in front of somebody and really state your case as to why you want to be at that particular university. Um, should you visit more than once? Again, this is going to depend on the type of institutions you apply to. If you do decide that you're looking at the tier one type of institutions, they will 
most of us keep um, pretty sophisticated records of how many times a student visits. So even at Ryder, we, we actually are looking, if a student is in a gray area for us from an admission perspective, we're looking how many times did they visit our campus. Other institutions will be even more specific. And they'll say, you know, was it a minimum of three visits? And what did the, those visits consist of? Did they meet one of our regional recruiters if it was an out of area type of uh, place? So that does become important, and you'll be able to get that feel as you start to work through the process. Again, I would point you toward the, towards the guidance counselors. They'll have a great opportunity to uh, tell you what's important to each of the universities uh, and colleges that you're looking at. Okay, so then you're getting ready to apply. And how many of the seniors have already applied? Show of hands. Okay, good, good. All right, so we've got one. Um, oops. Okay, so make a list. What's, um, Tony, what's the typical at this school, about six to eight? Okay, so six to eight colleges are the typical um, amount of schools that a student will apply to. I am, um, as I said, I have um, friends that have kids this age. When you go back to when I applied, the typical was two to three, maybe four. And it was, it was all about, in those days, it was a lot about how many times you were paying an application fee and how many applications did you want to fill out. Uh, what is something I'll talk about in a minute is the Common App. And the Common App is now representing over 500 colleges and universities. And I don't know what the percentage is of how many students fill out Common App compared to other type of institutions here at Lawrenceville, but we see more and more uh, students that are looking at and completing the Common Application. One of the questions um, that I'm always asked is, uh, do you look at a Common Application different than another application? No. Absolutely not. We're, we're really, the common app, the app, whether it's an, one of Rider's apps or a common application or a fast app, has anyone received a fast application? Which comes with pre-filled um, in type of data as part of the application. We get three different types of applications. We're not as much interested in looking at the, the uh, way or how the student filled out the application. We're more interested in the essay, the transcript, the letters of recommendation. That just gives us the demographic type of uh, institution. I think one of the things that is really critical is as you're going through the application process, you have to understand what is specific to that institution. Are they requiring you to do ACTs um, or it, 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 specifically for subject matters or SAT type of subject matter testing. The majority of the institutions will be looking at either the SAT or the ACT. But you will find for some of you that they will ask for a, a specific type of test that they want you to complete. And again, I would point you towards two, two people because I feel like I'm pointing to Tony a lot. Um, I will also give you my card. So, if you're going through other university websites and you say, I'm not getting it, what is it exactly that they're asking for? I'll point you to the guidance community, but we are right here and we would be happy to provide that service. Even though it's another university, this is, this is what we do in higher education. So the other piece, and I, I will do uh, some additional thing on testing in a minute. So if you have other questions, just hold on to them for a minute, is, we are very familiar with our terminology, but sometimes I know that our terminology is not very familiar to somebody that's starting the application process. Um, early action, early decision, preferred deadlines, and rolling admission. And I will tell you that the majority of colleges and universities not only do one of these, but they might do two or three. So I'm just gonna briefly go through. Early action is non-binding. To give you an example, if you apply to Ryder before November 15th, we guarantee an answer to you before Christmas. And it just takes some of the angst off of the senior year and getting that information out. 
what early action means is that even though we've admitted you, you are not required to tell us that you have accepted us until May 1st. That's early action. Early decision is binding. So again, you'll see a lot of early decision deadlines, November 1st, November 15th, December 1st. What that means when you apply those, to those institutions, if you've been admitted to those institutions, it is binding. You are committing, since they gave you a space in their early decision pool, that you will be attending those universities. I will, I will tell you, and I'm a little old school on this, if you go early decision, you should be very, very sure that that's the school that you want to go to. You want to uh, make the commitment to that institution and you want to make clear that that commitment is uh, something that you're doing. And typically with early decision notification, it, it again is before Christmas or maybe in January at latest, maybe February, but I think most of them are trying to hit December and January. So that's, that's the early decision binding. Preferred deadlines. Preferred deadlines work almost in coordination, very similar to early action, where they're just suggesting, and you'll see this at a lot of rolling admission schools, where they prefer to see the applications before a certain point. What does preferred mean? What preferred means, for the most part, is they want to get your application in, in, uh, in a timely way enough so that you're lined up for whatever you need to do as next steps, it, meaning that if you were admitted, financial aid. So we are a rolling admission school that has early action, and we have a preferred final deadline of February 15th. So if you can follow all that, we do three out of these four. We don't do the binding. So each school might do one of them, two of them, three of them, or all four. And as you start to go through the process, the only one that I would say that you have to be incredibly careful about is that binding one, because that binding one is a serious commitment. And the university is building their class, expecting that when they accept you, you're going to accept them. So I already did common app versus institutional app, no difference. Fees and fee waivers, uh, the fees and fee waivers, you can uh, certainly work with your guidance counselor to request those. There will be, um, and because there is a mix of seniors and juniors in here, I had talked about the fa FAST application, or they'll, they might call it a specific application to their institution in which data is filled out. Typically, those application fees are waived. Uh, for the majority of the schools that participate in that. Um, and they will also waive the common app fee if you decide to do that as opposed to the FAST application. So what else is required? Complete transcripts. If you've transferred from other institutions, we do need the transcripts not just from the home institution but from the original. The only exception to that is when we can see a complete, complete list from the school that you're applying from. So if Lawrenceville listed all the schools as well as all the grades, then, then we only need the transcript from the original uh, or from the uh, high school that you're currently attending. If not, we'd like to see the original from the high school that you transferred from. Test scores, and I'll get back to test scores in a minute. Uh, recommendations. Typically, universities will ask for anyone, anywhere from one to three uh, recommendations, letter of uh, recommendations. We'd like to see the one letter coming from the guidance counselor and at least two from other folks. Uh, I've been asked previously, can one come from somebody outside of school? Can it come from um, somebody that I've worked for or my dance instructor? Again, that's going to be based upon the institution. An institution like Ryder, we will allow that but other schools might be very specific and say, no, it has to be from two people that have taught you in the classroom and your guidance counselor. So there's gonna be a, a, some, some shifts there as well. Essays. Essays, if you've already looked at the common application, uh, one of the things why many students like the common application is that it is um, very concise with the amount of uh, words that you need to complete 
the overall uh, essay component of the common application. I'm not recommending one over the other. Uh, it's what you feel comfortable in, what medium you feel comfortable in. Uh, if you want to submit su supplemental essays or a supplemental um, art projects, if you're going for a creative type of uh, program or degree, that's, that's certainly welcome. I, again, with that double check with the institution, because some institutions will say, I will absolutely not look at it and we'll, we will just throw that away. And I don't want to see your good artwork getting thrown away. But you, if it is something that is important to you and the school is open to accepting it, it is something that you should uh, absolutely consider. The activities and experience part, they are important because there will not be a college or university that you visit that will tell you that we just want you to be good in the classroom. They will all say, we want the well-rounded student. We want the student that's involved in, involved in clubs and activities and ultimately shows leadership. And more than anything, what they want to see is an adjustment process. Will this student be someone that can adjust to the campus? What I will um, recommend to you is that when you're listing your club's activity experience, focus on the ones that really matter. Uh, because it does not do anyone, it doesn't do you a benefit of listing 20 clubs that are not very active on your campus. It's much better to have the three or four that are key and that you're passionate about. That if you were to do a competitive interview with one of these colleges or universities and they say, well, you know, I see that you're part of the drama club, why? That you could answer that type of question. Um, if it's something that every high school has clubs that are established that might not be as active, and if they start to ask questions about that, and you can say, well, we had one meeting, but you know, I'm waiting for that second meeting, it's, it's not gonna come across good in a competitive inter interview. So you really wanna think about not loading the list, but loading it with, uh, with quality as opposed to quantity. And the interviews, I think we've already talked about that. You can, uh, you can certainly do competitive interviewing as well as just informational interviewing. The competitive interviewing, I do recommend that if you're, if you're looking into schools that require a competitive interview, that you practice. And I, I said to Tony earlier, there's um, at least three of us at the uh, Ryder campus that have done competitive interviewing at other universities. So um, we, I'm offering our services. We would certainly be happy to do that just to get you ready for an interview. There will be other opportunities. You can certainly look on websites and get a sense of what a competitive interview will look like from a question perspective. But I think it's important that you do practice that because that is something that if you go in and you feel a little uncomfortable or nervous, um, you're not gonna be your best. And I, and I want you to be your best as part of this process. If, can I see a show of hands? Are any audition type of folks in here? People that will be auditioning for uh, either fine or performing art type of degrees? Okay. Okay, so now, now we got to the part of you've turned everything in, what actually happens when we review the application? Everything, every application, this past year we, we had 8,000 freshman applications for Ryder for a class of um, just about 950. So every application goes into a folder, even though everything comes in electronically, uh, get, is put into a folder. Transcripts are on, for, on top with a, a sheet that outlines for us your uh, overall GPA as well as the GPA for your um, academic courses. So we look at both of those GPAs. Uh, class rank, although more and more schools do not rank, and that's not really a, a critical factor for us. Then we start to look at that transcript and uh, pay close attention to did you take the most competitive courses that you could based upon the grades that you received in your freshman and sophomore years? Was there a progression in the courses that you took? That's what grade trends uh, means. It just means did you have a spotty first and second year and you're really kicking in on junior year? That, that, that definitely tells us something. If you had a, a good freshman and sophomore year and you're starting to decline, that tells us something as well. 
In that latter case, when that is occurring, I urge the student and, and I would urge the parent to set up interviews because that I think is important to start to explain to, um, uh, to the admission folks what's, what's occurring and how things are gonna shift. And again, you're not gonna apply to senior year. And if you're sitting there saying, well, you know, am I at, is there, you're in first quarter currently? So you're in first quarter, if grades are, you don't know yet how grades are for junior year. But if you find yourself at the end of the junior year and there was a challenge, you need to be able to communicate to the schools. Because a school will tell you, too, this is a challenge that if we see this, this, and this in your senior year, you have a better opportunity to be admitted. The school will also tell you, this is damaging. And so this might not really work out for you if you go through uh, on the application process. And I will say, again, I think Naviance provides you a lot of uh, inside information. College Confidential provides you a lot of inside information. But ask that more difficult question. And if the student's not comfortable asking it, parents, I urge you to ask it. Because you don't want that set up. Uh, and you don't want to be part of a process in which uh, schools and universities are just trying to increase their applications. You, you want to be in the driver's seat and know what's best if you're the student or if you're the parent and say, this is, this is probably too much of a reach. On the flip side, if the grade trend has been solid, that is something that you, know, you can start to ask some of the more specific questions about what is this going to mean, what kind of senior courses should I be looking at, and what can I do to position myself best when it comes to scholarships at your university. Okay. So test scores, SAT or ACT. I would tell you that the majority of the colleges out there right now are, are pretty much seeing an increase in ACT uh, takers, but are in, here in the Northeast, if you're applying to schools in the Northeast, the increase means that they're probably falling somewhere in the area of 20% um, uh, submission of ACT. And again, I'm, I'm clouded because of where I sit. Uh, some of the more competitive institutions might see as high as 35 to 40%, but SAT still dominates this area. You may find the student that ACT is a more comfortable test for you to take. You may find that you want to take both SAT and ACT and see what's best for you. I put it on as a bit of a joke here. How many Saturdays must I give up? It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to answer that. Um, I would say what I normally see is about three test scores. So students that have taken the SAT three times or twice SAT, once ACT. Others only take it once, and others take it seven times. And I would say once you reach a certain point, and again, I would urge you to speak with your guidance counselors about this, because after you've taken it three times, you pretty much know what is happening and how, how you're increasing each time. So I would really uh, urge you to have that conversation as to whether or not it would benefit to go into a fourth or a fifth SAT. Super scoring, do most of you know what I mean when I say super scoring? Just briefly, what super scoring means is, uh, and many universities do super scoring, but again, you have to check the individual websites whether or not they do it. But super scoring is basically taking your best uh, out of the SATs, your best, or ACTs, your best scores for each of the three sections. Uh, Rider Super Scores, as well as many other type of institutions in this area and institutions similar to Rider. Test optional schools. If you're applying to test optional schools, and this has been a trend that's occurred over the last five years, more and more schools have gotten test optional. If you're not submitting any type of standard scores, please be very careful to check to make sure that they're not requiring you to do something additionally, like an essay or uh, submit um, a graded paper, because many of the institutions have said we're test optional and you don't have to submit anything. 
but there are still institutions that are requiring an additional step. And that will be very clear when you attend their information sessions or if you talk directly to the admission counselors. Again, the, the uh, additional step that they ask for is to try and get more information from you about the student, about the student's uh, academic profile. I think we already did this one as well. Uh, some places it's going to be optional, some places it will be required. Um, some will say we just don't, we don't want to see it. Um, I, I would, I'm talking generically from a university perspective and three is usually that magic number. One from a guidance counselor, two from other folks. There will be some schools that will do less and some that will do more. But that's for the juniors and for the seniors that are, that are really uh, in, in the thick of the process. Seniors, you should already have identified those two faculty members that you want to think about, or that one faculty member, and if the school allows you, that one external person. And then the guidance counselor recommendation is always the other piece. Okay, the, the, the application essay part, what should I write? Typically, most in, and most of you will have experience going through the common application, so you will have topics of what they're gonna ask you to write about. Uh, and those topics are pretty specific about an experience that you've had or, or something where you've shown leadership. Um, you can easily get these topics on any type of the, um, just, just Google common application this year's uh, topic questions. And, and you'll be able to get that. What you should write is you should write something that really expresses uh, the strength of your writing as well as tells something unique because you want to keep it as um, um, uh, very ungeneric in the sense of if you think about 8,000 applications and that everybody at our office at Ryder reads those essays, uh, everybody looks at a file at least twice then you want to make sure if that essay is that key piece that's going to help you get admitted, that you, you put a little uh, punch into it. Make it about you. Make it about your experience. Don't talk uh, in generic terms. It, it's, just not, it's just not going to work. Spell check is, is so easy, so please, please do it. And the other piece, which is, is something when you're doing mass essays, uh, and this is not so much true with a common application as it is with other applications. It's very, very difficult for an admission counselor to read an essay at Ryder that tells them how much they would love to be at TCNJ. Mm -hmm. So when you do those essays, when you do those essays, we understand that you're reusing them. But please, go back and double check and make sure that the school that you're applying and submitting the essay to specifically addresses the school in which the essay is going to, uh, because that is, that is one of the pieces. Parents, how much should you be involved in the process? I can't answer that for you. I think that's really up to your son and daughter, and I think that goes back to how you currently work together with homework assignments and, and different types of things. I think this is, this is one of those things, again, if I go back to what I recommend for, um, uh, for friends that have kids applying, I say, you better read their essay. But I, I don't know where you all are and if your son or daughter is comfortable with that. Um, but I do recommend that if students, if you don't want your parents to read your essays, get somebody else to read it because they will pick up on that comma that you missed or that uh, sentence that doesn't completely make sense. Uh, quality versus quantity when it comes to activities, absolutely. And auditions, I don't think we need to cover that. So you think you're in and that you're done. So what happens after you're accepted? That's when it starts to get really interesting. Uh, what happens first is you need to figure out the third piece. Remember the first piece? the academic fit, the second was the social fit, the third, this is when the rubber hits the road for the financial fit. And this is when parents, um, you'll have a process in which you'll start to fill out the FAFSA. Has anyone, does anyone in the audience have col uh, college students now and have experience in the FAFSA? 
So you can share with the rest of the group what a treat it is to fill out the FAFSA. It's like doing taxes. But we don't want you to be afraid of it. And one of the things that I will put in a plug, and again, this has nothing to do with whether or not you want to attend Rider or not, but we have two FAFSA workshops in December and June of every year, excuse me, December and January, in which you can just come in, even if you're not interested in applying, that will walk you through the process if it's the first time that you're filling out the FAFSA. The FAFSA is the main piece that will really determine what your financial contribution is going to be. You will probably, yeah. What is this an acronym? FAFSA. It's the Free Federal Financial Aid Form. Unfortunately, both higher education and, 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 um, and the government love acronyms. So the, the FAFSA is going to be your main form to determine whether or not your family, where your family contribution falls. That form is not the determining factor for merit awards. Typically, merit awards will start to go out either with your acceptance letter or uh, sometime in January or February. But the FAFSA is the main form that most colleges and universities use. There is another form. It's called the profile form. And some universities require the profile instead of the FAFSA. So that's the one place you need to check. Some schools will ask you to submit both. But the majority of us use the FAFSA. The, the other piece that I'm not sure you're all aware of, and again, I would encourage you to, because it's, I think it's pretty easy to find on the Rider website, but keep in mind that we are all required to have on our website a net price calculator. So basically what that is, anyone can go home tonight to the school that they choose and go on and just do a search on net price calculator. And what that will do is ask you some profile, academic profile information on your, on your son or daughter, as well as some financial information on your background, how much uh, the family income is. And it will tell you what your net price is projected to be. Keep in mind for juniors, it will, it will be based, well actually for seniors and juniors, it's based on last year's tuition rate. So most colleges or universities have averaged a two to 3% increase this year and probably will do so again next year. So you just need to keep that in mind that even though that gives you a good idea, it doesn't give you a perfect, a perfect idea. Financial aid's gonna be a complicated process. I think one of the things Again, please take advantage of us uh, and these workshops that I mentioned. It is, it, I say it's complicated, but it really isn't when you start to get into it and, and understand how each school doles out their components of financial aid. Just to give you an idea, this past year, Ryder committed $54 million of its own funds to make it much more accessible to families. Uh, in the financial aid arena, and we're not alone. Most of our private um, colleagues are, are giving decent awards that are both merit-based as well as, well as need-based awards. And when I say merit-based, that means that there are no requirements. It's just based upon the academic merit, merit of the student. So if your parent's sitting there and saying, I will never qualify for financial aid, based upon your son or daughter's academic record, you may, just in the form of scholarship. So don't discount that. Um, typically what happens is there's a transition. The transition will start for seniors and, and for juniors any time from November to April. November to April is the period in which you are admitted or not admitted into the universities. And then starting, I would say usually end of February to right up until May 1st, there are events on the campus that we've now selected you. You need to decide if you're selecting us. So these events are called admitted student days where they pretty much bring out the, bring out the faculty and the clubs and activities and give you an opportunity to see what the campus is really like. And I would urge you to go to those days. But remember back to how I broke down the different visits that there's a big show which is called the open house and then there's interviews as well as uh, information sessions figure out what works best for you 
because these admitted student days will be big and you might find that you would rather come to campus on a day that gives you the opportunity to sit in on a class, meet with a professor, and have lunch. And that might give you more than what this admitted student day does because they get, they crowd, they get crowded and big. And uh, you know it, it really depends on what you're looking for. By May 1st, you need to make a decision. And that decision is a national decision. Every college, every college waits for that May 1st deadline. The guidance counselors wait. And as parents, you're finally probably getting up to that point where you want that decision to be made uh, by your son or daughter. I will warn you, the last few years, we have seen more and more students wait to really that last weekend in April. So if you find a level of frustration with your son or daughter as, why can't you just make this decision? Don't pressure them. This is the biggest decision that you've ever made in your life. And you want to make sure that it's the right one. Uh, with that being said, take the time you need. Uh, but May 1st really does, uh, May, May 1st is the deadline for all of us. And then what happens after? Um, you start the orientation process. So typically, most colleges and universities will go into a summer orientation process that includes some testing as well as two days of fun, getting to know possible roommates, as well as um, having a parent session as part of that process. OK, questions? Yeah. Essentially the same. I think one of the things that um, you would want to do is, again, you all know, if you're the student, you know yourself better. And um, parents, you know. I would read up on the tests. The, the one thing that people will say is the ACT gives that third part, which allows you to kind of choose a subject matter. And if that subject matter is history or English, you do have to be careful because some schools will say specifically, we want it to be this or this. But if you find that that might give the student the opportunity to be a little um, stronger in that test, then I would suggest the ACT. But I, I really, I'm, I'm urging you to look into the different types of um, structures of the test and what's gonna make you feel most comfortable. Because everybody will tell you, it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's much more about getting to that point where you're comfortable with the test. Whatever that takes, that will give you the best performance and results from those examinations. Yeah. Speaking of something else, speaking on that subject, um, how automated is the application review process? I'm noticing whether it's through the uh, Princeton Review or the College Board websites or certain things, I'm looking at what the average student GPA is compared to what the average for this year, what the average um, SAT score is. And I'm finding that it seems like the SAT scores are low compared to what the GPAs are low, at least for the sun is concerned. So I'm wondering what are they I mean, are they going first round, going by what the numbers are, and then once they now they take a more personal look at each application, or is it, I mean, what's the actual process for that? And everybody heard the question? OK. So I'm going to explain our process, because a lot of schools follow our process. And then I'm going to explain a larger uh, public university type of process. Um, our process, because the SATs count for 40% of the overall um, index, where we're, we're counting the uh, the actual uh, the um, transcripts for 50 percent and 10 percent for the letters re recommendation and essay we look first at the transcripts and then look at how the SATs inter interact with that and I would say many schools the size of Ryder the types of institutions will tell you the same thing there will be other schools that have just mind-blowing amount of applications so the, that, that is 
in the area of 50 to 60,000 applications that they have to process. And they will be more score driven first and then start to look through the ones that meet the cutoff. Does that give you enough? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's really, it's gonna be individualized, but when you, when you think of a process of, um, I don't even know, and Dan, I don't know if you know this, how many applications Rutgers got this year, but I would say it's probably in the 60,000 range. So they, there has to be a way for them to uh, say, pretty clear cut, this is the first way we're gonna cut off. Other questions? Yes. What if you go uh, the early uh, decision, and when it comes down to it, finances just don't work? Typically what happens, you're admitted early decision. And as part of that early decision process, they award you a financial aid information. And then, so typically, let's, let's just make up the dates for the schools that have early decision. December 1st, you'll get notified that you've been admitted early decision and it's binding. By December 15th, they give you information that tells you how much financial aid they're gonna give you. By February 1st, you have to tell them that you have committed. If you financially can't make it work and you've talked to them, then it's, it's no longer binding. It's not a piece that they're gonna force you to go there if you can't afford it. So it's to nobody's benefit. But it doesn't operate against you at other institutions then that you have? Uh... It's not been my experience, no, no. I mean, the, the piece, I think, I think the majority of us are understanding that um, the challenges that families are facing with um, piecing together the financials when I earlier talked about the three pillars of the academic fit, the social fit, and the financial fit, I would say the financial fit has become more and more important, and we all understand that. And I think the institution itself understands that. The challenge that you'll see is many of the institutions that still are um, early action, or excuse me, early decision, you might want to check whether they are uh, need-blind institutions, if they're meeting need 100%, because in those type of situations, then you're not going to run into the scenario that you're talking about. They're going to give you what you need. But in others, they might not. They might not be in a position to give you as much as you need. And I think there is that understanding that, um, that, that there, and, and there is, from an enrollment management perspective, and knowing Having worked at an institution that was had an early uh, a binding or early decision piece, we we did count on a percentage of students that would not follow through. Very small, very small percentage though. Other questions? Yeah. You mentioned um, merit-based scholarship okay. get accepted. Mm -hmm. Typically, it depends on a lot of NCAA regulations as far as when uh, families can be talking with coaches, but most of our national letters of intent, and again, I'm going, because Ryder's a Division I school, if we're sending out a national letter of intent, we will uh, pretty much have all those out before May 1st, some of them way before. And just because I know of the sport that we're talking about, some like wrestling go later and you don't you don't have that commitment to may or june uh that being said you typically want to know where you stand and you'll get a read uh, most of the athletic scholarships are controlled by the coaches so we we i work very closely with our coaches but i basically know before the start of the recruitment season. Okay, we're gonna recruit. We have 10 men, men and 10 uh, female Division I sports. And I average anywhere from 60 to 75 athletes that we're recruiting each year. But I know what that breakdown is it's pretty specifically. Like wrestling will have three this year, tennis will have four this year. And that's information I'm getting from the coaches. So they really are your main contact when it comes to athletic awards. 
And that, uh, that's just raising a good point because one of the things that I will tell you is from, if you're looking at a division one program, you really need to be speaking to coaches early because they are, uh, they do the prim primary part of the re recruiting is either the spring of the junior year or the fall of the senior year. So they, because it's incredibly competitive and they want to make sure that they get the best athletes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So do you have to make two applications? No, it's always one application, but based upon the structure of the family and uh, the finances of the family, you would need to report on um, both the mother and father's income. We're, we're going we're gonna to have a financial aid night in December, in early December. You can check the date on the guidance website on the calendar of events. Other questions? Yes. Um, regarding the SATs and the ACTs, is there a particular time that you would recommend for students to first take that test? Uh, I would. Um, do you want to go? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what we're seeing is that um, a junior will take it in the spring for the first time. And that'll leave one or two more opportunities uh, to take it uh, three times, as Jamie suggested, fall of the senior year. However, with kids being so busy with activities, what has gotten popular in the last few years is for kids to take a prep course over the summer. Um, and that happens um, before junior year. It can happen before junior year. So a junior could take the prep course over the summer and then come right in and take the October SAT or ACT, which just happened, the, AC, the SAT just happened on Saturday. Any juniors in here? Okay. Any juniors take the SAT that just took place? Okay, that's start, starting to happen more and more. But the typical, the traditional is once in the spring, once or twice more in the fall senior year. Perfect. Other questions? I have, I have a question. Sure. The, the age-old question, yeah. I guess this only applies to the juniors. Should the junior take the regular level course yeah. in an academic subject to get an A or should the junior opt, I'm sorry, for, for their senior year, should, should that student opt to take the AP level or the honors level course, maybe struggle a little bit more, get a B or a C? How does a college look at that <coughs> on the transfer? Typically, we're looking for you to take the most competitive and rigorous courses that you can. I think one of the pieces that's important for us, and most, most institutions will look at an AP course or an honors course and know that um, there's some different types of weightings, we will weight that differently at our institution and we are in the majority. So I would always say take the more competitive courses, push yourself, that's what we're looking for. Yes? Right. Or maybe, you know, just, you know, a couple days drive. Do they, um, I mean, is there an expectation that you visited multiple, I mean, or spent more time there? And also, my son said that he heard that the school doesn't consider, I mean, a competitive early decision. If you haven't visited the school, it doesn't show that you have as much interest in the school, and they may not take the, um, you know, they may not, I guess, feel that you're interested enough if you haven't visited prior to the time. 
I will tell you that that will be true at certain schools. So that's not, the, the, the tracking pieces that schools are doing are really um, uh, trying to keep a competitive admit rate. So they want to know that if the student is being admitted, that, that they're not wasting that admission. So they want to see the interest. Um, getting back to your, your question of like, when's the best time? It, it really is, it, it, it's hard because you might have a situation where you have a son or daughter that's looking at five schools and they're all plane trips. I, I would say that's when you have to really start to narrow it down and say, what are the top one or two? And how are we going to do this? And what are the other three that we might only visit if we get admitted to them? I, I, I think if there is that one school and you know that they are counting visits and you have everything else is going well as far as the transcript and the, and the scores, you want to you want to continue to pet, put your best foot forward. I will tell you, many schools understand the travel constraints and the challenges of um, getting to the different areas. I have a good friend that um, he he with his daughter is saying, is it as um, impressive to the school that we're going to the Tulane night here, you know, somewhere in Mercer County? as it is if I go visit campus. I said it definitely will be recorded. I know it will be. So you have to weigh it. But I, the other thing is I can't imagine, I mean, every year we have 30% um, of our population comes from out of state and we're starting to see a lot of kids from California and Colorado and sometimes the first time they're visiting campus is at orientation. And I just can't imagine making such an important decision without starting to get that feel for it. So, and Thanksgiving, not a great time because you won't see students on campus, so. I was gonna, I was gonna jump in. Yeah. Um, not just for early decision, but all schools, all colleges will give you some sort of bonus, uh, intangible points on the application right. for visiting. Now, a lot of people visit, but the college doesn't know that they're there. So when you visit, whether it be taking a tour or stopping in an admissions, make sure you, they know that you have visited. Yeah, they get your point. name in the admissions office somehow. Then the other point, um, when, when's the best time? The best time to visit is when the school's in session. That'll, that'll give you a sense of the social fit that Jamie was talking about, if possible. If my son is a senior, though, and we're getting the, he wants to do early decisions, Better to do early decision and not have visited yet, or is it better to do regular admission and get a chance to not possibly visit the school and then apply? Well, the whole concept of early decision is you're so sure that that's the one that you're going to put your eggs in that basket and apply early decision. It's hard to have that strong of a feeling about a school <coughs> if it had to be early action, I'm sorry, early action. Okay, okay um, then, then, that, then that changes it. Yeah, it's more flexible. Yeah, or, early action changes it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Regarding early action, if you apply early action and you're not admitted, are you back in the pool for later admission? Depends on the school, but many schools will say yes. Um, I would say the majority would say yes, but you might have a better feel for this. But okay. they're, they're going to they're going to tell you uh, some schools they're going to say no thanks. Typically, the more competitive schools, other schools said will say your your numbers don't get you in for this pool, but we're going to continue consider you for the regular pool. They're going to see what their regular applications are like and if they and if they still uh, have space. And typically what we'll do is we'll go second quarter grades, see what second quarter grades look like. Yes? Yeah, I, I think it has become more of a norm. 
that um, the, the one thing that is um, very dramatic that, that's occurring with higher education or the demographics right now in the Northeast is the de decline of the 18-year-old. So there's, there's a lot of schools that are maybe more aggressive than you want them to be with your son or daughter as far as uh, excess mail or um, phone calls. I would be very direct with them and say, we're, we're not interested and can you remove us from your list? Because there, there is, I, I mean, as, as somebody who is, um, you know, obviously trying to uh, get the message out about Ryder and, and wants to see application growth and, and strong enrollments, the other piece is we don't, there's no desire for any of us to look like we are hounding students. That's, that's just not worth it. Yes? We, we have a bunch of schools coming to Lawrence. Is that, uh, that tracks? It's, it's tracks. Uh, when the college reps, college reps from, top, from different colleges have been coming in since the first day of school to meet with Lawrence juniors and seniors uh, in the Career Center and the guidance office. Um, it's not tracked in the sense that the, that the student has gone and vis visited the school. However, every student that visits at least fills out a card and gets in the college's system. Um, and more importantly, usually that college rep that we post is the first reader of the application. Right. So yeah. if so, if the, if the rep remembers the face when when he or she sees the application. That's to the student's benefit. So students, please come to those if you're interested in those schools. That's a really critical point because we most universities uh, read by territory. So if if they make a connection with that rep. That rep is that person that will advocate for them if they fall into a gray area. Yeah. Is there a way for parents to know what colleges are coming into Lawrence? That's the first I've heard of it. Uh, it's, it's on the website. Uh, we have a college, college visit. So you go to high, uh, high school, then guidance. And I believe it's there on the side. Um, now. I'll get on a microphone. Whenever I'm on a microphone on a stand, I usually have to bend over. I have my mom's voice in the background telling me to stand straight up. Um, when your son or daughter goes on Naviance and puts in a list of schools that they're interested in, Naviance generates emails when the colleges come to visit. So your son or daughter is notified if they have 15 schools, if eight of those schools are, visit are visiting Lawrence, they'll come in. Uh, they'll, they'll get an email. Doesn't the student need to kind of track how many times they're absent from class when it's all these problems? With this freedom coming up in college, the hope is that this, your son or daughters will be able to handle, handle that. They, they know. They know. It's been going on a long time, and it's, it's been a great thing. Um, the earlier question about the difference between the SAT and the ACT, I wanted to touch on real quick. Um, the SAT, they're, they're different. The SAT is, is thought of as being more of an aptitude test. In fact, that used to be in the title long ago. Um, the A was for aptitude. Then they changed it to assessment. And now the acronym, acronym doesn't mean anything. So, but, it, but it, that's more of the uh, aptitude test, whereas the ACT is more what kind of student uh, your son or daughter is, um, what their performance has been in school. That, that's how the ACT comes across. All that being said, I've read studies that say that for 80%, it doesn't matter between the two. They're gonna get about the same score 80% of the time. Yes. How uh, competitive is Lawrenceville considered across the country? What percentile would you say is I think Lawrence is very competitive. Um, probably the first way that comes to my, to my head is the number of AP courses that we offer. Not to say that students need to take AP courses to be competitive, but just the type of rigor that's here at Lawrence. Um, our number of AP courses, 16, stacks up with our, with our neighbors with the bigger, with the bigger names. Um, 
So, you know, that's, that's one way. Um, but for any kid um, who does well in school and does well on, on a standardized test score, that's going to tell a, a huge part of the story, regardless of where they go to school. I want to thank everybody for coming out. As a Giants fan, I didn't, mean, I didn't mind this night going so long. <laughs> now I have to go home and subject myself to three hours of turnovers. And um, I'd like to thank Mr. Jamie O'Hara for coming by. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. I have uh, business cards up here. If I can be of any help in the future, please feel free to take a business card. There's also some writing materials. Can you get the slides? Yeah, I could send it, I could send it and put it um, on the site. E even better, um, we videotaped this tonight. So I'm hoping to get, now I'm new here, but I'm, I'm thinking I could get this on the TV channel as well as on a, on a YouTube channel that I can link somehow to our website. So I'm hoping for you to be able to access this uh, in two ways. Okay, and if anyone has questions, if that's not happening quick enough, uh, please contact me and I'll, and I'll see to it. Um, hopefully your son or daughter will come and see their counselor for, for help with this and I'm available for questions as well. Thanks for coming out.